So it gives me a great honor to introduce our distinguished alumnus uh, speaker. We sent a, a request to all faculty to vote for a speaker uh, uh, for the alumni meeting um, and recognize the distinguished uh, alumnus. And Bob Zura won that vote uh, and, and he is here uh, to share his experience um, and, and his talk about mentorship and his journey here at UVA. But I just want to tell you a little bit about Bob. Bob is a year ahead of me in residency, and we've been very tight since residency. So as many of you know, and you're here together with your friends um, from residency, you have a, a bond that is incredibly strong that lasts a lifetime. And Bob and I ha share that bond in, in many ways. Uh, but Bob went to uh, um, UVA for undergrad, played lacrosse here, and he went to Hopkins Medical School, and then he came back here for residency. Uh, in 94, and um, then did a trauma fellowship at Ortho Carolina, and was in practice at, I think, Medical College Georgia first, and then in Fredericksburg, and then went to Duke for 10 years, and was uh, the tra a trauma surgeon at Duke, and he started and then was recruited to be chair at LSU New Orleans in 2016, where he's done a tremendous job elevating the reputation uh, of that program. Um, he's a, a phenomenal educator, great surgeon, uh, over 150 publications, several leadership roles within the trauma world. Um, and he's uh, just a wonderful friend and uh, been someone who we've talked over the years about leadership and about how, as we moved into our leadership roles, what to best do. So, so uh, I have a lot of great stories about Bob from residency that are incredibly embarrassing. So we'll talk about that over some drinks later on today, but I want you to help me uh, welcome Bob as the distinguished alumni speaker for our alumni campus. I guess I'll take the first shot across the bow. Uh, well, thank you all for, for bringing me in and, and having me here. It's, it's a real honor and I appreciate it. Uh, I forget who sent me the initial invitation, but it came with no indication what I should speak on. Uh, so I kind of went my own path. I had a couple of choices. Uh, we've published a lot on non-unions. We have 800,000 non-unions that we've looked at and, and 800,000 fractures and lots of real world data and big data. And I decided that would just be awful. I didn't want to even hear it. Uh, Alumni meeting, so I figured I would you know, focus a little bit on you know, our experiences here. I, I designed a talk for the residents who'd be in the room, even though it's alumni. It's my it's designed to kind of talk to the residents because that's sort of where my brain is, I think. Uh, and I decided I'm good with a cocktail in my hand. I live in New Orleans. I'm going to tell some stories and maybe make some people uncomfortable. Uh, and I thought that would be kind of fun. And I guess I'm going to pay the price later when Dr. Chabra has got a few beers in him. So I, I called it a turtle on a post uh, just because that's sort of a, a post turtle is an interesting sort of concept. It has a political connotation to it. And this isn't political and it's not that way at all. But anytime you see a turtle up on a post, you know that that turtle had some help getting there. And I think that we're all sort of that thanks to our mentors. And I'm going to walk through our mentors and our teachers here and, and tell some stories. I really do want to say thank you to uh, uh, to everyone for inviting me, uh, and in particular, you know, Pamela and Carly, for, who just, you have a great group here, making it very easy to to get everything together and, and be prepared for this in advance. Uh, and sincerely, it, it uh, I don't know how close the vote was. You thought Bobby probably would have said it was pretty hard, heavily in my favor. Maybe it was close. Maybe I got two and everyone else got one. I don't know. But, uh, but it feels like an honor at this point. Uh, to be here. So I, I do want to thank you for that. I do have ex disclosures, but I don't think they uh, matter when we're telling Bobby Chabra stories. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, I live in the northernmost Caribbean island called New Orleans. Uh, it's down here on, on Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, I went there in 2016. Uh, I actually got married at the Boar's Head, right below where we're going to party tonight. And uh, the band playing was Louisiana Mudbugs. So my wife and I would know New Orleans in us at all and decided we wanted to have some fun. So it's probably appropriate that we end up down there. Uh, again, I went in 16, but as you may or may not know, in 2005, this little storm came through the Gulf, Katrina, and forever changed my city. Uh, 
it's sort of like a, a person who didn't go to war talking about being a soldier. I don't want to pretend I lived through it. Uh, and it's dramatic when you doors close and people start talking about it. Unbelievable the damage it did to our city and to the psyche of the people and to just to everything. Uh, uh, and, it, and it still hovers over the city to some degree. But as you may or may not know, New Orleans lives below sea level. So my house is four feet above sea level. So I don't have to have flood insurance. I do, because this can happen. I look up at the Mississippi River from my home. It's 13 feet above us. So you know if the river breaks, you're, we're gone. But this was New Orleans right after Katrina. And it, you know, it was 100 degrees the next day, and another storm came in a week later. So devastating to the city, as you can imagine. Roof of the Superdome was blown off. It was used to, to, home, to house people. No air conditioning, obviously no power. You may have visited New Orleans and seen the grades above ground. This is why, because when it floods, the bodies would come up. So the, you know these these crypts actually did did their job after the after the after the flood. Uh, this is called an X code that we'll put on the abandoned homes. If you kind of can see what it is, so that's the time and date in, in the top that the rescue team got there. To the right, any hazards that may be present. I don't know if you can read it. It may be like you can't get in or there's rats or, or things like that. To the left were just codes for what rescue team went there. And the bottom was the number of live and dead victims found in the house. So you can see this, this one was September 12th and you know one alive person, two dead people in this home. And that was sort of all over the city, just a, an unbelievable uh, event. If you get a chance, watch the documentary Katrina Babies. And you know, some of my current medical students are that age. You know, these kids who are toddlers and airlifted out of their homes in New Orleans East. And it's an incredible documentary done by a kid who was you know, young when it happened. So give, give, give that a watch if you can. This is Charity Hospital. It was closed down the morning after Katrina. Dr. Abel, Dr. Kaler trained in this building. My office is the dirty building just to the right of it. Uh, still empty. They just spent $10 million getting the asbestos out of it, million square feet. I think it's going to be renovated again. There's been a lot of different plans, but that's sort of the pace of New Orleans. You know, here we are 15 years later, and it's still to be determined a political fight. But that was closed down the morning after. All the records were in the basement. So they're all gone. So a lot of studies are gone and being able to, to find out what happened to those patients. These are residents taking patients out of Charity Hospital the day after Katrina. You can see that patient's intubated, uh, taken out of the ICU. Uh, the trauma center became a two-room a two room outpatient surgery center out in Metairie became the trauma center the next day because that was the only hospital open, two-room ASC. But New Orleans and, and Charity, if you will, did, did rise from the dust. And uh, this is a university medical center where I work now. It's the prettiest hospital in the, in the galaxy, I believe. It's uh, by state law. We have a lot of weird things happen in Louisiana, but by state law, 1% of any building has to go to art. So we have $1.3 billion hospital. We have $1.3 million worth of art hanging on the walls of this building. It's incredible. And it's, you know, it's a charity hospital. So it really is a phenomenal place. You see the streetcars coming by and it's a vibrant, fun city. So if you get a chance, come down, visit me. Jazz Fest is next two weeks. It's a really good time to visit. Uh, you miss French Quarter Fest, but it's, it's fun. I love UVA and I love UVA sports. You've heard about it and I'll mention it a little bit more, but I will tell you this was fun. Winning in football really is different. Seen, I've seen UVA win a lot, but I tell you, this this was a lot of fun to be there and be part of that. So if, if you get a chance to come down on a Saturday, we'll take you to a Tigers game. And that that's unlike anything else uh, I've ever been to. Tailgating is fun. Come for the Florida game. They cook whole gators, and it's, it's fun. <laughs> and this happened recently. I just put, think I'll bring it up. Just, you know, I don't know how I got in there, but there you go. So that, that was a fun one as well. So I'm going to talk about sort of my and our ortho experience. I'm really very, very thankful for everyone who trained me here. Uh, and, uh, and every single one of us who are alumni are where we are because of those who mentored us and trained us here. It's interesting. I've looked at Mark's talk ahead of time on the syllabus, and, and Bobby's talk was incredible. Uh, we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but there's going to be some redundancy. I apologize for that. But it's also interesting that we all, I think, are kind of taking a similar tack and how important that is here and what a great, great place this is to train and to be a part. Of. And, you know, there's my you know, really sophisticated world turtles on a post, you know. Uh, it is about the people in your life. And we'll talk about that a little bit. You know, this is job life. We've heard some work-life balance focus on those people, but it is all about the people in your life. I'm going to try not to be, you know, generalized. I'll try not to be too empiric. 
Uh, but I'm just going to tell stories. It was my experience. I hope it reflects some of the stories of the uh, of the other uh, uh, alumni in the room. I'm certainly not trying to take over in doing it. But the reality is I was the one that has to talk. So you're stuck with me up here talking and, and telling it. And please forgive my uh, my memory if I get some of the things wrong. Uh, I'm a pillar guy, you know, and I, I do believe in patient care education and research. I think they are important. We don't have to do all of them. As I've evolved through my career, I, I guess if I'm in public, you have to say patient care first, but I don't believe that in the least. I really do believe education is the main pillar in, in medicine. It totally is. Not a religious man on any level, but it is sort of that teaching someone to fish rather than giving them a fish analogy, if you will. And in my state, we have four and a half million people, 1.4 million of them are on Medicaid. We're the only people who provide orthopedic care to them in the state, the only ones. So if I can't train people to take care of those people, we're, 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 not, we're not able to do it. So education really is, is, is really a fantastic thing. And it's the pillar that I think is the most important. Uh, my mental sunrises of putting this together, it really is the little moments in your career and your life that matter. And what you do to other people, and I'll tell some stories about little tiny things that have huge impacts on me. I redid this talk. I guess this is a little bit of an older version, but the other mental sunrise I had is I was really an idiot when I was a resident. I made some stupid stuff. And I was told that by these faculty. Uh, and I'll share those things today. Uh, but I'm surprised how dumb I was at 26 or 27 or 28 or whatever I was. Kind of a shame. Uh, hopefully I got better. Uh, UVA orthopedics in the simple term really is and was a very special place. And I'm just going to go through chronological or you've heard some of these stories as people made fun of me earlier today. But I came here in 86. I'm a Baltimore boy. So you play lacrosse. I play lacrosse here. I put played in quotation marks because I spent a lot of time on the bench. Uh, and uh, because of that, I didn't get hurt. You know, I was a sort of a practice dummy, but especially you look at the kids tomorrow. They're big now. When I played, they were little. So I was twice as big as everybody. So other than the turf at Scott Stadium, I didn't get hurt a whole lot. You don't play, you don't get hurt. And I didn't get hurt in practice, which was good. I chose number 27, Ken Clausen, the only three-time first team All-American in UVA history. Schellenberger will probably be our first four-time. I wore 27 also. I have told Ken that he wore it a little bit better than I did. Uh, but uh, it was great. So as an athlete here in, in undergrad, you know, you meet the icon. And uh, there's so many stories about this man, and I and won't pretend to, you know, to tell all of them by any means. But what I learned from Dr. McHugh really was, you know, that absolute dedication to the UVA athlete and to every single one of his patients. And he loved UVA, he loved athletics, but he didn't care you were an athlete or not when he took care of you. Uh, you really did learn the benefit of knowing every single person that you came across and remembering those patients by name and their family. And it's phenomenal, his ability to do that. He gave out orange jackets at graduation. Who's old enough in the room to have one of those? We didn't get them. We got blue jackets with an orange V on it. And I was blue jackets with a blue jackets with orange. We didn't get the orange. They used to be like all orange, like Masters Green. They got all orange. And I was so upset that, it, is it Elio's? Is that the store? El Joe's didn't have, Elio's is a liquor store near my house in New Orleans. <laughs> uh, I didn't get the orange jacket, which is really a shame. A little bit hypothyroid then, my jacket size smaller now, so I wouldn't be able to fit into it anyway, but but I, I wish I'd had it. We heard about this earlier. Uh, he was a master surgeon with a knife. He, he did everything with a 15 blade, he was like just flying through a finger and you would sit there and you did watch more than you did, like Bobby said. But nothing was done poorly. It was phenomenal to watch this man operate. The knife would get dull, he'd get a new knife and keep going. It was just a brilliant anatomist, brilliant surgeon. Really was an honor to, to work with him and train with him. My double entendre there is I had a, I met Dr. McHugh again as a non-athlete once I stopped playing lacrosse. And I had, you know, a cool roommate who you know, was going to try to show up some girls. So did, you know, this with the knife, you know, at a party. All the hand surgeons know how that ends. It's not the down hand. It's you slide down the hand and you cut the flexor tendon on your ring finger. So my roommate did that uh, and Frank fixed his finger. Uh, so I got to see Frank again. We, we, he, he got us in because he remembered me. And I just remember when he would call, as, as I mimic people in my brain or hear people in my brain, I hear a lot of cuss words. And I think there were a lot of unpleasant words that came out of Frank's mouth, if I remember correctly. Dr. McHugh, excuse me, not Frank. And I remember I got a call from him one night and uh, someone's daughter was coming to the ED and he didn't want any gosh darn 
medicine doctor, which he didn't say medicine doctor to see him. Didn't want any gosh darn ER doctor to see him. So get down there right now, Bobby, and make sure. And this is the daughter of the mayor of the football players coach in some tiny town in Virginia. And he knew everybody in the town. And this girl was hurt and she was coming. He goes, go see her and don't let any of these people. And he had terrible terms for all the non-orthopedic surgeries. And then he would get more fired up about it. He goes, oh, he goes, do you know where my loops are? And then again, another GD comes out of his mouth. He goes, don't even let her sign in. Get out to the waiting room. Don't let her sign in. Do you know where my loops are? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, drive my loops to my home. I'm going to operate on my goddamn basement. And you go tell the patient, go to Frank's house. You get his loops. I think he lived in Bel Air from my memory and drove his loops out there. And I don't know where it went from there. But, um, uh, but he recovered athletes in his basement. The older guys know this. The older guys did blocks for him, did you know carpal tunnels in the clinic before it started. But really an amazing guy. But the stories, get the stories from the older guys tonight. And I'm one of them. I have some of those stories too. As an athlete, got to meet Joe Geek as well. And I don't know how many people in the room know him or the younger folks. Uh, he was the head trainer at UVA at the time. He really did treat us expertly and with respect, uh, uh, just a class act. And you know, one of my first entrees to, in addition to Dr. McHugh, to UVA orthopedics. And I grew to understand the crucial role of the trainer in sports medicine from, from Joe and meeting him. And, and also there was a new young trainer, a few years older than I, you know, Ethan Saliba, who I know is still here. So I think he's still working, right? Basketball. Just, I know that, yeah. But he was, you know, our, you know, our assistant trainer, whatever, for the lacrosse team. He was friendly, dedicated to the team, again, treated us, treated us so well. And he's one of these people that you realize, one of these many lifers who really defined this dedication to UVA and UVA athletics. Uh, he exemplified excellence in class at all times. Uh, and it really helped me understand more really that team concept of, uh, of sports medicine. And I think these three men are part of the reason, we're made, the main reason, you know, when I applied to med school, I interview med students now and I get silly answers, but my answer was crazy then too. I said, I want to be the Washington commander's doctor. That was my goal. That's what I wanted to do because of these guys. Now I met sports medicine later and you know, did trauma, so you can understand that. But really a huge influence on me and how they treated us. As I stopped playing sports, I could start to be a little bit of an academic person in school. So I uh, ended up, I wanted to go to med school, I had to work in a lab. So I ended up in Dick Edlick's office. I don't know if you guys know who Dick Edlick is or was. He's a plastic surgeon here, had multiple sclerosis, he wasn't operating any longer. Uh, specialized in burn, started the burn unit here, invented Steri strips. Again, he had MS, so it was a little bit intimidating as a young person to meet someone who couldn't walk, who was a surgeon. He and I and a, and a big group of people are the reason why, but he and I got to help him. Uh, is the reason why there's no powder on gloves any longer in the United States. And he's removed powder from all surgical gloves in the, in the, in the, in the country. Over 655 publications, the Jefferson Award. Uh, one of the projects I did with him was taking water out of the pool here at Kluge and looking at it. We actually found stool in the Kluge pool. And as a result, we changed. We actually went to the state Senate and changed the laws in the in the state for you know for uh, pool cleaning, which was pretty cool. Mentorship personified. When I walked in his office the first time, he's like, you know, I'm an undergrad and I'm a knucklehead. And I said, do you, you know, I'd like to wash beakers in your lab or do something to go to medical school. He's like, he was like, do you want to party all the time and have fun, or do you want to be serious and you know be a scientist? I said, oh, I want to work hard. He goes, just have some fun. And he's like, if you want to partner with me and change the world, come back tomorrow. And he just brought me in, brought me into his fold. And unbelievable until the day he died. I was there. Uh, he told me at one point, you're going to live on the lawn. I said, I'm not going to live on the lawn. I'm an idiot. And you know, I don't do any good things. He says, you're going to live on the lawn. And he dictates a uh, letter of recommendation for me in front of me, which was phenomenal and inappropriate. And he says it. And then he starts dictating again. I thought, boy, the old man's kind of lost it. I don't know why he's dictating another one. He dictates oh, another letter. He goes, sign that Dr. Ray Morgan. And a few minutes later, Ray Morgan actually walks in the room. He goes, Dr. Morgan, this is Bob Zurich. You just wrote a letter of recommendation for him. Ray said, okay. So that's how I met Dr. Morgan. And I got on, I got on the lawn. Uh, I, I was tired of Charlottesville. I grew up in Baltimore. I was tired of Charlottesville. I looked out of my lawn window and I could see the hospital. I was like, I don't want to be here. So I chose to go to a foreign medical school in Dixburg's. He was so angry at me for going up there and uh, he's called it a foreign medical school. It would never call it by name. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll talk about Coops a little bit later, but when I came back to do research, you would actually send my, uh, I bartended at Coops as an undergrad and in medical school. And he, uh, 
actually would send all my research paperwork and my mail to Coupe de Bills because he didn't really like that I was doing that as well. Uh, huge part of the emergency response system here at, at UVA, uh, he brought in Pegasus and more, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a little bit. But uh, it's, it's also important to realize, you know, outside of this incredible group and all the rankings of Amish stuff, it's a phenomenal university. So, you know, as, as you walk around here, you're missing opportunities every day. Take some of them if you get a chance, meet some of those people. It's really a tremendous place. Uh, my long years, that's your fourth year at UVA. I had the opportunity. I tried to get Ralph Sampson's room, but I, I missed it. So I was in four East Lawn. I wanted to, I wasn't a morning guy in college. I wanted to look west and see the sun go down. Uh, and I got to know Dr. Detmer. I don't know if Dr. Detmer's made it here. There he is. He, uh, he would walk his dog at night. He had these giant dogs and uh, he'd whistle as he came around. He was a provost, lived in Pavilion One in the, in the, in the academical village in Jefferson's original design. And uh, he would, I seem to think fourth year college is for bourbon and cigarettes. And he would come by and, you know, he would tolerate our bad behavior, but we got to know each other. We've been really have become lifelong friends. Ironically, has an interest in compartment syndrome. has published some of the seminal works in that, in that as well. And uh, so we've maintained sort of a professional uh, relationship as well. If you think you're smart, sit in a room with Don Detmer, un smartest guy in the room always, I believe, unbelievably brilliant. Some of the things he talks about with policy, I, I, I nod my head when I visit him. I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, so I don't even aspire to, uh, uh, to, to achieve what Don has achieved. So I did go off to a foreign medical school more appropriately than I realized, uh, but I went, went back to Baltimore and regretted it immediately. Uh, it was a great place to be at school, and I got to be home and saw my parents a lot more. But uh, I did miss Charlottesville. So I spent a lot of time back in Charlottesville as I could. So I did clinical rotations here, did research rotations here. I still worked at Coops a little bit in medical school. Uh, so I'm, in my clinical rotation, there was a chief resident named Dave Beedock. And I still remember Dave took me aside and showed me a pelvis. Do you remember trauma, Dave? Is he still here? Is Dave still here? Did he leave? Uh, and he taught me about APCs and lateral compressions and fracture patterns and probably why I grew some interest in trauma. And then threw me softballs in conference, made me look smart. So as a chief resident, the impact you have on students in their career is unbelievable. So those really is those little tiny moments. You don't remember that. You don't have a clue about doing that. I don't think you probably did it for everybody, but that, that meant a ton for me in my life. Uh, I did some research with Dr. Edlick and, and Kayla, giving me an opportunity back down to Charles to do some bartending. I did some CT stuff with Dave that we actually did some, some navigation stuff in pelvic surgery, which is probably a little bit of forerunner to some of the uh, uh, percutaneous stuff that Adam Starr does and all that sort of things. Again, I still work to Coops. So I think I did four or five months at UVA as a medical student. Research, clinical rotations, as many as I could, and I didn't get an interview. I was like, well, I, I was kind of hoping I would get an interview down here. So I called and Dr. McLaughlin at that time was the, I think he's a program director. So, and I said, I'd like an interview if you would think about having me. And this came down they said, well, we thought we interviewed you. I said, you didn't. And he said, well, come on down, have an interview. And so I came down and interviewed with Dr. McLaughlin and Tom McGovern, who was one of my, one of my classmates, was sitting in the room. And he's like, did you rotate here? He said, yeah. I said, do you get an interview? He goes, no. I said, you have to call. He said, yeah, I had to call. So not really sure how it was happening, but finally I did get an interview and it did work out. And then I interviewed with Dr. Wong and I said a few nervous, few nervous words to Dr. Wong. And he said, fine. He goes, if you want to be here, I'll make you number one. Let me know. And I said, I want to be here. And it was over. Went back and told my dean. He goes, well, you can't trust me. But I said, I trust him. Ranked at number one. I did put other ones down, uh, and I ended up here. I'll talk a little bit more about my interview later. So I finally make it out of my foreign medical school. I come to UVA for, for residency, but as you know, we did six years then. We did 18 months of general surgery. I disagree with Bobby. I think the 80-hour work was great because we were. The best call was 24 on, 24 off for the ED. Plastics, you're on every night. Every other time, you were on every other night. So you walk in the hospital, you're there for a minimum of 36 hours, you go home, sleep, and come back, which was too much time in the hospital. It was a great experience and all those sort of things, but it wasn't orthopedics and I wasn't there. But during that time, I did meet her, which was pretty cool. Uh, I ended up marrying Mary Ann. She met her. She was an undergrad. I was in medical school, I guess, actually, when I met her. We got married in 1996. Dr. Wong, you gave me a candlestick for my wedding. I know where it is in my house. Uh, our rehearsal dinner was at Coops. Not sophisticated. 
not cystic. And then we had the Louisiana mud bugs, like I said. Uh, at Mary Ann's med school graduation, she was up on the, the rotunda when the balcony collapsed at Pavilion One, which was you know Don's home, uh, which was you know changed that that entire day. Uh, I'll try not to get upset here, uh, but it was my family and Mary Ann's family. It was on the on the balcony. Give me a second. <laughs> So 18, 19 people were injured that day. Marianne's grandmother died. Marianne's mother had open tibia, open femur, open patella. My father was in the ICU in AFib. My mother had an open olecranon. Tom had bilateral crushed feet. I broke, I fell on my mother. I broke her elbow. I broke my hand. My father-in-law, I don't think, was hurt, maybe hurt his foot. Dr. McLaughlin was, uh, I can't imagine what that did to Don and Mary Ellen for just, that was their home. And, and I just, I don't know, I can't imagine the impact on their lives. And I, I don't know if I've ever really asked him. Uh, is Rob McLaughlin in the room? He was there earlier. Yeah. His dad was on call and Dr. McLaughlin was awesome. He was a great man and, uh, you know, great doctor. But uh, nobody was going to let him do the trauma that day. All right, it's upsetting me more than I thought. Dave Kaler came in. Greg assisted him. Uh, Dave Kowalk was the uh, chief resident. Dave, they said, you can scrub, you're not touching them. And, you know, it took care of them. Uh, I remember Dave and Greg come up to me in the recovery room. I was, you know, second year resident, and they're both crying. And they let me know that Marion's grandmother had died. But just that care and that kindness from my family, just, it meant, meant the world to me. I'll get it back together. And, and Shep cared for Tom later on. Uh, and, and provided expert care. So really, you know, it was a tremendously tough time. Uh, but it ended up, as you'll find out in a second, it did actually help a little bit in some weird way. Uh, this is, you know, Dick Edelick, again, uh, you know, emergency care person. He didn't like the way the emergency care responded to this disaster in Charlottesville. So he actually wrote an article about it, one of his 655, which just kind of brings it full, full circle on Dick Edelick. So I'm finally an orthopedic resident. I finally made it. And, and we're here. Now I can tell some good stories about people. Now, just before my time was Dr. Stamp, I didn't know the man. I'd met him, but uh, his legacy really was huge in the early direction of our department. And this is from your website. But I think it's important for people to understand that he really, I, don't, I won't read it to you, but he really, I think, changed the direction, from my understanding of this program, to an academic program, to, you know, involving research and, uh, and, and it already been a great clinical program, but really changed the path. But it was, you know, Dr. Wong, who was was my chairman and and uh, and still my friend, scared the hell out of me. Absolutely, still does. Uh, it master in the operating room, just an absolute master. He would do the first case of the day. We did like twenty five minute total hips, and you just would watch in awe and try to get the orders in in time to be done. And just phenomenal skill. Uh, and uh, and then he would let us run uh, in the later cases, which you know it, it, it helped us get our hands under us. I still remember, as I think back to Dr. Wong, Dr. George Dye here and I used to maybe try to talk like Dr. Wong when he wasn't around. And we would put a lot of cuss words into it. And then we weren't sure if Dr. Wong did use that many dirty words. And we listened to him pretty carefully. We realized he did use quite a few. Uh, he was pretty good at them. And I, as a junior resident, had to pin a hip fracture in a patient with a BKA. So Dr. Wong is my traction. He has the contracted BKA limb, and he's pulling the traction while I'm a two putting K wires in a hip, and he is cussing me like a dog, and he's yelling at me, and I'm doing it wrong every way you can do it wrong. I'm in the pelvis, I'm in the bladder, I'm in the nerve, and uh, he never took the case away from me. Let me get it after. It took a long time. You were tired, you were sweating, uh, but I remember that. Oncology conference was a, the opportunity for, for Dr. Wong to, to uh, use the Socratic method uh, to all of its punitive ability. Uh, he would bring in people from labs all over the state, I think, just to watch us sweat. Uh, it was hard, but boy, you studied for that conference and you, know, you, were, you had motivation for self-learning because of that. Uh, and, and I still, still remember those days, still remember studying for them. We would try to help each other out. It really built camaraderie. It was a, it was a great conference. It was a wonderful conference. He is hysterically funny, just an, a comedian in the operating room. He's, he's one of the funniest people I know. My memory of that, uh, you all have your own, I'm sure, but I was always operating either too fast or too slow for Dr. Wong. 
if I was going too fast, he would insist that I had a blind date that night and that I needed to cancel the blind date and, and just concentrate and take care of the patient. If I was going too slow, he assured me that Amy would only feed him dog food if he showed, home, showed up late at home and would, would encourage me to move along quicker. But he uh, uh, was funny, and he, and he, but he was, it was a really nice way of guiding me to, to go in the right speed in a case. Real scientist, we heard about his AVN work earlier, but it really was a chance to meet and, and know uh, an academic surgeon. Incredibly human. Uh, I remember watching him as he was recruited back to Taiwan my chief year. He was exhausted because his mentors would call him during the day in Taiwan, which was the middle of the night. So I think he was up all night getting phone calls and being recruited to be president of a university. And we could, we could kind of see that on his face, but it was interesting to see you know, one of your heroes kind of human. Uh, he's also very human about Marianne. Marianne, for political reasons, I was a third year. She was going into pediatrics. There was some politics in the peds department, which is, you know, doesn't matter, but she didn't match here. Uh, and Dr. Wong actually allowed me to change my education. I had to spend a lot more time in Roanoke because Marianne scrambled into uh, uh, family practice or a primary care a path down there. So we were going to be able to spend more time together as a married couple, which is, I thought, you know, incredibly kind of him. Turns out if you kill someone's family, a graduation, you, they find a spot for a residency. So they actually did give her a pediatric spot. Uh, the loyalty that you know, Dr. Wong you know, shows to, to his residents and the leadership he portrays, it's you know, something that I aspire to. I, I still remember uh, uh, something had happened on call and I went up to his office before uh, conference started. So it was like 5.30 in the morning. He's sitting at his desk working. And I said, Dr. Wong, you're gonna get a phone call from the emergency department about me. And he said, fine. And that was it. And I'm sure we all you know, have some sort of story like that. But uh, the loyalty to the residents was incredible. And I've seen it the other way with some leadership. So that, we all appreciated that. And then you make it to the end and you would have shots with Dr. Wong in his basement. He would give us brandy. And I still remember we were talking that we could drink more than him or something, which we thought we finally could break down the, the wall. And I remember him saying to us, and I think I had said something smart. And he said, I, I hear a lot of thunder, but I don't see any lightning. And he took a shot and he moved on. So he, he made it clear that I was not at his level at that point. So, so I still hear that a lot of thunder, but no lightning. So there you go. Dave Kaler was my mentor. He really was a uh, trauma surgeon. Was the reason I'm in orthopedic trauma. Uh, I don't know if he knew my name. Uh, it was jackass almost every other at the time that he referred to me. Uh, and as you'll find out, some other folks you know, chose that same term for me. Uh, Phenomenal surgeon, you know, one of the technical best surgeons I've ever worked with in my life. Uh, uh, I would take extra call. If people need a call cover it was Dave. I'd be like, don't worry about it. Don't pay me back. It's like, I'll, I'll take call with Dave any, any chance that I can. It's brilliant. I remember uh, being in an elevator with him and someone was talking, the ophthalmology residents were in there or something talking about a paper and he knew the paper and could converse in ophthalmology literature at the same time. Brilliant guy. He wouldn't tell you this, but he, he let me know at one point. He got a call from his chairman at uh, Tulane after he graduated. And he says, come in the office, Dave, I have a bottle of champagne for you. He's like, why is that? He goes, I just got a call from the board. You got the top score in the country on, on his boards. So he was the smartest resident in his, or smartest resident in his class, at least. The outdoorsman, he, you know, if you got to see him on his property, the stress went away a little bit. Sometimes there was a beer in the water, but uh, he did love being outside a great, great uh, uh, shooting skills. We had wellness opportunities. As our residents, we would do some paintball at his house. Uh, one time we did it inside and Dave, I was, I don't know how to shoot and I was just walking around sort of clueless. And Dave pops out behind some blind and some neon thing, covered head to toe in camouflage. Looks and goes, hey Zura, I guess he knew my name at least. And he shoots me square in the crotch. He goes, jackass. And then he backs it up. That was the end of my paintball night. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the kids are weird. Uh, he used the operation game in residency interviews. He said he learned a lot from him. He was one of the first people to do that. So, yeah, so I think I think he pioneered that. And you know, the other thing Dave taught us, you know, which I, I won't dwell on, but he did have demons, and I think we can learn from some of those as well. And you know, you know. Uh, uh, and, and unfortunately, it's a terrible way to, to train, but it really is sort of the last you know, message that he did give to us. So uh, uh, if you know the story, you can just sort of watch those same events in your own life if you can. 
Uh, Whitehill, uh, I was a little scared of him also. Uh, he was in the back of Fracture Conference with you know, the cool older guys like Birch and Michay, and they'd be laughing. And I thought they were kind of you know, yucking it up too much or either just being cool and I wasn't cool and it upset me. But what I realized from that is that they were making orthopedics fun. Uh, and it could be fun. And that was a change for me because you work every other night for two years and you're exhausted and you think you're banging your head against the wall. And, and Dick really did have that ability to... Uh, uh, make it fun for us. He was great. He gave us surgical freedom, unlike almost anyone. We would do ACDFs on our own. Uh, and he gave us confidence that we could do that. And he also knew that you had a master behind you that he could recover from whatever mistakes you, know, you would make. And, and that was incredible. Uh, he obviously was and is an artist, but I could never figure out if he was an artist or perfectionist. I put this cervical spine thing up because every single time we put one of these ACDF plates on, he wanted it to be perfectly vertical and he never could get it quite right. He'd be looking at it from every every particular way. Uh, one time he came up to me again, I don't think he used jack, the jackass term, but it certainly was implied. And he's told me I look like a slob. He's like, shave, you idiot. You know, just clean up and look better. And what I realized this is one of the idiot moments in my life. I realized that, you know, as a president, sometimes you forget that you're a critical part of the team, that you really are part of, you know, seeing the res the patient and, and they are judging you and other people are judging you. And I had never thought of it that way. So we felt like worker bees probably a little bit more than we should have a lot of service. But he sort of brought that point home to me. It's like, just clean up and be professional. And, you know, that's when I learned it. So from, from Dick, and I appreciate it. Very humble. I don't think if you tell you look at his CV or get to know him, he was a phenomenally talented surgeon and academic surgeon and you know, travel. He fell me phenomenal. I don't I'm not sure that we or even UVA has done enough to recognize just how great Dick is and was. There is a White Hill lecture, which is a, it's, it's an awesome way to celebrate him. And I, you know, I did have the opportunity to uh, uh, to give that talk once, which was a great honor. Uh, and I didn't say these things about him in front of him. Uh, Dagan, we've talked about him a little bit already. He's not here, but, you know, I do remember him as a master educator talking about, you know, different ways of teaching. I still remember Greg Dagan standing in front of the room, bending over to describe how the scaphoid would be like over a wire. And, and he's physically acting this out in front of the room and spending all this time. I still didn't understand carpal kinematics. I never will. Uh, and I, get, I, I sort of gave up hand and peed for the boards like they can have those. I don't understand it. Uh, but he, he tried. He tried really, really hard. Great, great educator. I put this Danny in there. I can't remember what it was. At the end of every rotation, if you're busy, if you're a fourth year medical student, you want to do orthopedics and the day you're going to ask for a letter, Greg would call the person by the wrong name the whole day on purpose. So if it's Bobby, the last day, he's like, Danny, you did a great job this month. So glad that you're here. And just torture the kid. Uh, and then at the end of the day, he obviously would... Uh, uh, would, would, would know his name. And, uh, family man, you can't talk about Greg without Kubota, this crazy little truck that is a huge res resident advocate. Uh, I really find that my educational priorities, I model him the most. It was an honor to trade with him. And it really is a huge loss that he's not here on a daily basis at UVA. It really is. I remember calling him near, and as became a chief resident. Who's chief in the room? Uh, I don't know how long it took you to figure out, but I called him like July 3rd. It's like, this sucks. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, chief residency is terrible. I thought it was cool. I thought I could hang out with Whitehill in the back of the room. It's like, but I have responsibility and Dr. Wong expects me to know. And he's like, takes most people a little longer to figure it out, but you're right. Uh, and then I wasn't going to do a fellowship at first. And finally, I said, I'm going to do trauma. And I called him. He said, Greg, I'm going to, I am going to do trauma. And he goes, I know. And I said, well, how did you know? He goes, hey, yeah, I just know. Uh, he was just a phenomenal uh, educator and mentor. Dave Duck, we talked about that. He's over here. Dave. Uh, you know, I talked to you about him as a chief resident and what he did, but you really, the, those little moments and the power of mentorship and feedback, and like I said, we talked about as a chief. Dave sat me down in the cafeteria. I don't, back then, there was a little coffee stand, these two cute little guys, and they started a coffee stand, made a million dollars, opened two stores, made $2 million, and retired during the course of my residency. Uh, but Dave sat me down in the back of the cafeteria, and he, and he reflected on how I had done good and bad on the sports rotation. And... So I should go into academics for, you know, whatever reason he had seen in me or whatever. And I never thought about it, never thought I could, never thought I would. And that's why I did right there, you know, a 15 minute talk. So those little moments that you have in, in guiding people and, and you guys and talking to medical students and junior residents are huge. They really are huge. Uh, Dr. McHugh gave me a sheet of tickets for the ACC tournament, for the basketball tournament one year. And they had paper tickets back then. And I declined them. 
And, uh, and, and, and I just went to operate with Dr. Dedock that day. And Dr. Dedock said, did, did Frank give you a sheet of tickets for the tournament? He said, yeah, every game. And Dave said, he's never given me tickets to the game. And I said, you can have mine. And he goes, well, why didn't you go? I said, because I'm operating with you. He goes, Bob, if he ever does that again, you go. And it just kind of let me know from Dave that you value your time outside of here. And, you know, let me set my priorities a little bit. I always appreciated that. Um, the worst thing you can probably imagine, right, you know, is uh, who's the head of trauma here? Is it still Jeff Young? Yeah. Transferred orthopedics means you have to be able to survive in a garage with a pail of water, right? My wife abrupted in Dave Dedunk's living room with a bunch of orthopedic surgeons around. Now, the diagnosis was just, you know, a little bit of bleeding, you're going to be fine. And my wife says, take me to the ER. We were supposed to go to her. So we didn't trust any of the orthopedic surgeons. So Dave and I are forever bound that Connor Zura is on a train right now to come down here tonight. It was almost born in, in Dave's living room. Uh, but we, we got her to the ER in time. Lifelong dedication to UV, as you know. And uh, I still strive to match his character every day. And you know, I, I never will achieve that. Mark. So my interview, I interviewed with Dr. McLaughlin. He explained how he doesn't interview anybody west of the Mississippi. All the charts were on the floor. He was, thought he had interviewed me before, but he hadn't. Dr. Wong offered me a job in my interview with him, and I accepted. And I thought we were done. And then I interviewed with Dr. Abel, and he destroyed me. And I, I finally said, did you talk to Dr. Wong? <laughs> he gave me a job. You don't have to beat up on me. Uh, but he, he did. It was just, he was marked. He was thorough like he always always is. I'm also scared of him and have been. Uh, probably the most dedicated surgeon to, to, his, to his patients that I've met in my career. Phenomenal. At my, uh, my mother's funeral, a woman who my mom had befriended after I moved away came up to me in Baltimore and starts talking about her son, who she drives down here to see Mark Abel, and still does. And I'm, I know he knows who I'm talking about. It's a kid named Augie, right? You knew that already, didn't you? Already remembers him, and so uh, it was incredible. And I remember sitting in this building when it was Kluge and lamenting about the, the, the path of someone who uh, has a child with cerebral palsy or one of those you know, uh, terrible, terrible diseases and saying, I just don't know if I would be able to you know, stay married or, or do that or take care of him. And, and he just turned around and goes, of course you would, you idiot. It's your child. You take care of your child. And again, another mental sunrise moment for me. And I, I didn't have children at that point. I didn't know what it meant. But he kind of taught me just about sort of the priorities of, you know, being a parent uh, and a man or a woman, whatever whatever it would be, and, and, and how you would take care of your kids. And I, he probably said jackass also. I probably deserved it. Uh, but just I still remember that to this day, just, you know, him sort of saying, look, you just you, you know you have to prioritize your kids. And that's sort of how I figured it out the first time. At one point, Mark left me alone in the operating room. I think I was a senior resident. I didn't finish a, a, a femoral nail on call and took the junior resident through distal locking. And we did it great. We you know, got, did, did drill 17 times, put the screw in, high five, and we did good. And we showed the, showed the x-rays to Dr. Abel the next morning or that night. It says the distal femoral lock issue is not long enough. We're like, yeah, it is. I don't think it's long enough. I was like, of course it is. It's, you know, but he's like, if you're going to lock the nail, you got to lock the nail. So to make it worse, Dr. Abel made me go to, with him to see the patient. Dr. Abel told the patient that he had made the mistake and that we had to go back. So I'd take the patient back and, and redo that. But just that, per, that persistence and that demanding of quality has stuck with me. And my residents and my fellows over the years I've heard a lot about that locking screw, and I can assure you all of our screws are long enough, and, and they're long enough on, on all x-rays. Uh, so it had a huge impact just on the, the minute details in my trauma career. Shep Hurwitz has been you know, a lifelong friend and mentor for me. He was an outsider kind of to these lifelong UVA folks, which was really great. We got to see a different part of the orthopedic world, uh, which I really enjoyed. I got a handwritten letter in the mail probably through my work mail, so I don't have a stamp on it, from Dr. Hurwitz about a splint I had put on that he had to take off in clinic and, and enumerated the ways I had done it wrong. Uh, and uh, professional, not, not insulting, but that he'd taken the time to, to write this letter to me just to let me know how important every little thing you do when you touch a patient matters uh, and that he cared about my education. And I have a stack of letters, you know, monogrammed on my desk to this day because of that letter I got that I write. Uh, to people. Incredible. 
the, the P&O is still in this building, this building. There's a lot of orthopedic centers around the world without P&O in the building. They're in the building because of Chef Irwin's. I, I know it. Uh, but he made them part of the team. Uh, and you realize, again, sort of like sports medicine, this whole team of orthopedics, how important that is. He is a leadership guru uh, and still guides me to this day. He's connected us to the world of academic orthopedics and into the politics of that's going on, which we hadn't really seen without Shep. Still one of my most trusted advisors. And don't tell him that I actually really do like foot and ankle, uh, but I, uh, I didn't do that. Uh, but a lot of, I think a lot of trauma guys have a little bit of that passion. And he told me at one point he was going to stop whittling on people. Uh, not cut off toes and then half a foot in the middle of a foot. And uh, and I don't think he was being, you know, absolutely finite in that. But I've been more aggressive in getting patients to BKs and uh, to good level amputations that you're pretty sure they're going to heal and they get their function back and they stop having surgery. So I still remember that uh, that advice from Shep. I don't have a, a picture of Charles Miller. I couldn't get it. I'll, I'll probably skip a few people at the end just so we can get be done, have our break. Those who didn't know Dr. Miller, he was really, I mean, you can't think of him without saying he was just a kind man, unbelievably kind. He gave uh, financial education. So he had an MBA from Harvard uh, as well. And he, and I still remember, and I still quote, you know, 80% of advisors, you know, lose to the S&P 500. If you miss the 10 biggest updates in the market in 10 years, you lose 50% of your things I still say to my MBA, uh, Harvard MBA brother. Uh, and he says they're still accurate. Uh, and it was really cool that we got that education. That wasn't common at that point to get things like that. And to this point, we had something like it at Duke. And I've started, based on Charles Miller's teaching us, we have something called Leaving the Tiger's Den at, at LSU that we do. So it's for what you need when you leave practice. We have private practice guys come in and talk about contracts, about ancillaries, about uh, about finance, about mortgages, about disability insurance, about non-competes, all this sort of stuff. So, And that that came from Dr. Miller. And again, he is the most kind man. Didn't love call or coming in, but I really did break his kindness one day. Uh, he had a patient with a constrained hip dislocate. And I said, well, I'll just reduce it because you can't reduce it. And I was like, well, I'll just try. He goes, no, book it for the OR. I'll come in. Well, we have to revise it, you know, the, the constrained thing. And I was like, okay, you know, that's fine. So I, I'm a jerk, chief resident. I know what I'm doing. So I put the patient on the OSI flat top and I bring in fluoro. And I'm going to try to reduce it. Uh, and Dr. Miller comes in the room and he puts his hands together. And he goes, what are you doing, Bob? Because he thought it would be prepped and, and going. He goes, I'm trying to reduce it. And he squeezed his fingers together and they just lost all the blood. He started shaking with anger. And I was like, oh, my God. It's like, I just made grandpa mad and he's going to kill me. And he was furious and he didn't raise his voice. But he's shaking angry at me. And he's Bob. And then he looks at the fluoro and the head is perched on the cup with the ring there he goes hold on a second what's going on i went clunk and it clicked in and he goes you can't reduce these i said we reduced it i was very relieved at that point and he goes okay and two days later the manuscript showed up in my yeah. he he wrote it up but he kind of taught me it was like you do special things you write a paper it's not that hard to write a paper he, he wrote every word of this and made me senior author but i thought that was pretty cool of him to do that Dr. McLaughlin, again, I told you the interview story. Uh, I remember catching him in the shopping mall or the grocery store one day, and he had his grocery cart full of Guinness. He was a, you know, a true Irishman. And the gift of gab, he would talk about you know, everything when you caught him. Just a, a wonderful, wonderful man. My memory is that he brought cement over from the UK in his suitcase, like one of the first people to bring cement to the United States for total joints. So I mean, a real pioneer in the field. Again, kind, just like Charles Miller. Patient care at the end of his career, you know, I got, I was working with him as he was about to retire. And I guess I'm sure a lot of us were at that point. Uh, but I remember just patients just flooding his clinic to try to get a joint before he was finally re retired. And I still remember this one woman coming in. They all loved him. This woman came in, she was okay with her knee, but didn't love it. And she wanted her other knee done. But she had a few complaints about it. And he sat down on the bed with her and he put his arm around her. And he goes, Do you, did I tell you how great you look in that color dress? Because that's unbelievable. Took pictures out of his pocket of his grandkids, started talking to the grandkids, gave her another hug. He goes, God can make a better knee, but that's the best I can do. And she said, can you do the other one before you retire? He says, I can. Just a, a master, an absolute master with people. I don't think he was ever sued. Never, Never sued as an orthopedic joint surgeon. You know, phenomenal. And if you don't learn from him some level of how to treat patients, I'm just a, a true master, that really was. 
Blanco, he hadn't been here for a while. You know, I'll go quicker here. Just absolutely hysterical with jokes that would get him written up every day if he were here right now. Uh, he's not Southern. I'm a Baltimore boy, and I kind of appreciate that Northern attitude we had around him. Really a talented surgeon. Again, in this building right about here, uh, this isn't patient confidentiality because it's not Howie Long, but one of Howie Long's family members may have broken their femur on a movie set, you know, 50 years ago, long before, 40 years ago, long before the NFL. Uh, and we treated him. I don't remember if we put, I don't remember what we did for that child. But Howie was married to a woman who had been a Raiderette magnificently beautiful woman and Howie was this huge man but John liked her so much that he brought them back every week and he would just speak straight to Howie Long's wife Howie would be right here like a building and John would just be flirting with the wife for uh, 45 minutes at a time and then leave the room so it was it was tremendous but he really made it fun for us and again his jokes wouldn't be tolerated today Dr. Chan you know I didn't do spine I didn't work with him much but Huge impact on a lot of our peers, a lot of people who chose spine, uh, and it really was taught us about you know, the need to be efficient in the operating room. Uh, I won't talk about Joe or they're not here, and I understand there's, I want to be done. Helen Brown, I couldn't find the picture they showed earlier. I had to find a picture with the stash, and it, it cropped off from the internet. I didn't crop you like that. But you know, you showed up and you talked about private practice, and we didn't know that. We hadn't seen that, and you talked, and that was a great ex chance for us to be exposed to that part of the world. Uh, I don't remember why you left private practice, why you came here, but I remember you being candid with us about issues in your life, and 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 it was always very refreshing to be treated uh, with so much respect and honesty. Uh, he did operate with a different pace and purpose. I was getting some coffee this morning, and someone came up to me. You still mop in your own OR room? He goes, Yeah, if I have to. And that you know, we didn't see that sort of thing. So it was, uh, it was really cool to to have Tom show up mid midway through my residency and. Uh, and be a little bit of a peer. I don't know if it was an age or maturity thing that made us feel like we were similar, but uh, it really was a, a, it was a great addition. And it's really an honor to be here as you kind of you step out. And the irony as I thought about this, you know, you really, you know, I think of you as sort of that private practice mentor, but you've become you're really an academic force and, and an incredible teacher. So it's an honor to know you. Uh, I don't know Mark very well, but my last M&M as a chief, Mark Miller showed up for like his first day or for his interview. And I had stranger anxiety because, you know, as a chief resident, you know what you're going to get asked in conference. You know how it's going to go. You know how to navigate the pitfalls. And this guy shows up and just, again, used the Socratic method to destroy me in front of the room. And I was like, oh, my God. And I was like, I was upset because, you know, I didn't know any of the answers that he was asking. And he was like, well, it didn't go the way it was supposed to go. And I was supposed to be done. And it also sort of made me realize that UVA was moving on and up without us as we graduate. But that was great to see your program sort of evolving. Uh, and it's been fun to meet the new, young, incredible faculty. Uh, that book really is incredible. It really, and it's changed a lot of careers, as, as we heard. So it's really been a huge advancement for UVA. Uh, and then as I was leaving UVA, you know, it's, it's a weird feeling your last day. You walk out, you turn your beeper, and you walk out, and you look up at the building, and you can't imagine how the place is running without you. Not that you're egotistical, just like it, you got called 30 times in the hour before. They, they seem to want you to have, and you're done. Uh, but I was walking out and I was done. I was about to walk out the ED and have that experience when I got outside. And Bobby was in the ER. I guess he was, I guess he was just to become a chief. And I, you know, just a little moment of seeing his passion for orthopedics. So it was like the last day of residency. And a chief resident in the ED had asked Bobby to show him a splint. And Bobby was dressing down the chief and the attendant for this is your last day of residency and you haven't put on a splint and today you care about it you haven't cared about orthopedics for three years and and <laughs> would probably be written up today but i knew i knew the residency was in good hands and it's remained in good hands but just to see you know you've all seen it on some level but his passion for this place his passion for quality his passion for orthopedics uh uva is in great hands as you guys know he's my trusted friend it's a hard job uh, and you're, you find targets on your back that really can surprise you sometimes. Uh, I know Bobby's gone through that. I've gone through that. It's been a, he's been a great confidant, sounding board, and guide for me, and I hope I'm that to him to some level. But I didn't make a picture of all his friends and, and people who support him. I don't know if you noticed that. Here's his picture in my talk. But, uh, but UVA really is lucky to have Bobby and, and to keep Bobby. So uh so really this is an amazing place to train really you know value it and enjoy it incredible surgeons incredible people i cherish every moment if you can i spelled cherish wrong uh 
I hope I can you know, scratch the surface of some of these stories. I don't mean to embarrass anyone. I meant to celebrate everyone with those stories. It meant a lot to me, it really did. Uh, and I, if I forgot you, I didn't talk about my classmates and you, you learn from your peers and you learn from your other residents, uh, but I sort of focus on our, our teaching. And I do really think the, the, the mental sunrise for me in putting this together and thinking about it is, it's those little tiny moments when you interact with someone and you give them honest feedback and an honest thought and, and that you care about how they do that really does change you know it changed my career path dramatically uh it's from where i from how i do it and where i do it and what field i do it in so uh thank you very much to you know all of my mentors at UV and everybody here and thank you for having me and, and come visit us down the big easy if you can thank you